Fleming, News Director here at BG24 News. Here at BG24 News, every week we bring you the stories that matter most on campus, in the community, across the state and nation. The producers panel is where we take a step back and talk about the stories in our own opinion. But these opinions do not reflect the views of the organization and do not impact the way we cover these or any other stories throughout the week. This evening we will discuss the voter turn, uh, turnout for the 2014 election. We'll also talk about the possibility of drug reform in Ohio before finally discussing a new green space in Bowling Green. It's all next here on your BG24 News Producers Panel. everyone I'm joined here with my panel today we have to my right Megan Gallagher general manager for BG24 news and to my left here we have Matt Heitkamp who is the executive producer so thanks for joining us tonight you guys no thanks problem so uh, Tuesday's election saw one of the lowest voter turnouts in Ohio's history the biggest group of voters staying home were young people reporter Brooke Ebersol went to the student union before the election to ask students what they knew about the midterm election and if they cared here is what some of the students had to say about this year's midterm election. About what's on the ballot for this year's election? Um, not a whole lot. I know I've looked a little bit into Mary Taylor, and I want to say it's for the Ohio Senate. I know there's a couple of levies that need to pass. I know absolutely nothing. Um, I kind of pay attention more to like what's going on at home, because um, I'm from like the Cincinnati area. I did an absent absentee ballot for um, for back home. I live near Columbus, Ohio. I'm from New York, and not really paying attention to anything because there's no coverage of New York in Ohio, so. I don't really know a whole lot about what's going on. Do you think it's your responsibility as a voter to be educated on what the issues are? Yes. If you're voting, you really should know what you're voting for. It kind of takes a back seat, especially because it's not like a presidential election. The counties need to also put the information out there and educate you as much as it is your responsibility. I guess I would say that I would care, but usually there's a lot of things that go on um, in my life right now especially with school, so it's kind of hard to actually take time to think about politics in Bowling Green. It's kind of one of those things where I'm, I'm embarrassed because I don't know much, but I don't really care that I don't, so. Some honest opinions there in yes. the union. So I kind of want to ask you guys some of those same questions that Brooke was asking some of those students. You know, um, voter turnout was obviously very, very low. Young people are to blame, and so kind of we're all standing here, some of us with our tail between our legs, some of us not so much. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think as far as responsibility as a young person with voting in elections that are not big, fancy, sparkly presidential elections? Um, I think it is important, and honestly, what's interesting to me is I would almost think young voters would care more about an election that wasn't so big and fancy, just because we're kind of like, you know, one-stop shop kind of people at this point in our lives. You want to mm -hmm. get everything done as soon as you can, like, you know, fast, quick, because you have so much to do, like that guy was saying in the video. So it's kind of funny to me that we don't care as much about these that won't take as long and actually affect you more mm -hmm. than a presidential election, which is more national anyway. Yeah, absolutely, it's a responsibility. Some of these issues for this uh, were very important, like the levies for the library, et cetera. These are issues that will affect these students that go to Bowling Green. So absolutely, they should take a little more responsibility to find this stuff out. And you know, I can't help but feel like much of this apathy from young people with midterm elections and just small local elections um, is from education and there we aren't we aren't teaching students I mean from at least from my experience in school and from what I know about other people's experience is that we don't learn I think so much about local government as, f as much as we do about the big you know three right. branches do you know what I mean and that's yes. like something that you always have to learn and it's just kind of like I don't know it's just really glossed over I feel like do you guys remember in growing up in your you know different school systems learning a lot about local government or local elections not really at all. I mean, obviously we focus on, you know, the big stuff, the three branches, the presidential mm. election. I, like growing up in high school, I never ever remember in middle school, ever remember talking about, you know, your midterm elections, like until I, you know, got a little older, I didn't know it existed. Well, I remember even um, in middle school, um, I went to a school that is constantly kind of fighting for votes levy. for a levy, a school levy, because we just had um, really low resources. A lot of people who've always voted no, because we had um, a very large, um, 
uh, lower class population in our in our my hometown. So everyone always was voting no, 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 no. They didn't want to pay anything more in taxes. So we were always fighting for that. But that was the only knowledge we knew of levies in school was the mm -hmm. teachers talking about them failing. Right. But we never talked about what a levy is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like if you instead you like refocus that energy into teaching young people what levies are, they're going to grow up understanding how important they are, right. and they're probably more likely to vote for them at all, mm -hmm. you know? Well, and speaking of that too, I just felt also like BGSD did a really poor job this year of um, like making students aware. When it was a presidential election, there were like cards, you know, zipping around campus like, oh, like they literally didn't, ma it didn't matter what you were going to do. They're like, no, you're gonna get in this car and we're gonna take you downtown and you're gonna go vote. And I didn't even see anything in a campus update, nothing, which is strange. Nothing. Well, that's, com that's the college Dems and college Republicans um, student organizations mm -hmm. and I mean, yeah, they do, like you said, an amazing job during presidential elections because, I mean, that's what young people care about. But you would think that if there's a whole student organization dedicated to a political party, you that would it would be, be dedicated something. to it, you know, year round. Like, doesn't not right. doesn't matter what election it is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they you would expect at least advertisement, flyers, something visual, students to see to remind them, oh, it is voter, it is voter election day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I know that there are a lot of students who said obviously they didn't go out and vote, and they um, a lot of them say they're not even registered. Um, but do, what about absentee ballots? Do you think that as a college student, do you think it's more important to uh, vote for the local elections where you go to school or where your hometown is? So I had this problem. Um, when I first registered to vote, I was going to vote, I believe I was going to vote here, and I went up to vote, and they're like, you can't because I was registered in my hometown. So Could you um, not even vote on state issues? Um, I don't, I know, I don't, I think, I'm pretty sure they turned me down for, oh, wow. and I know that one of our friends, uh, also from Cleveland, was still registered in Wood County, and he went to go vote, and he's a political science major, so he oh, was, yes, yes uh -huh. he was kicking himself, and, um, because he just totally forgot, he which didn't is, didn't think to re-register in a mm -hmm. different And place. now, do you, I mean, go, I, you can answer her question, too, but I guess something we could think about, do you guys know why you're not allowed to register in two counties? I'm not sure why that is, but just like talking about, you know, registered voters, interesting fact that I found uh, for this past election, only 36% of eligible voters voted. 30? 36%. And Ohio was right around 36 too. And that was this, the nationwide statistic. And 18% was um, uh, 30 and was mm -hmm. 30 and younger. Wow, that's that is nuts. I mean, like, I know that I think the reason why you cannot vote and you can't be registered in multiple counties is because they'd want to avoid people voting in multiple counties. Which I mean, I understand. Although I think if you're gonna right. travel from one county to another to vote twice, that is some that I is understand some dedication. It, but it's also kind of like I mean, really like what. It's so you have like you want people to vote anyway. So why don't you just have them vote? Like, <laughs> well, have them vote twice. Right? Then. Why not? I don't know. <laughs> it's in two different counties. It's not the same. Like. I mean, I guess you could vote for, it would be pretty bad if you voted yes on the same person and no on the different person, like the same person. Well, so. I would just, yeah. I just think that I just can't help but still think, you know, well, on the, you know, school level that it needs to be something that we're teaching, you know, mm -hmm. young people yeah. a lot more. And I understand that there are so many initiatives, like we need to talk about math, we need to talk about science, we need to engineering and, you know, all these different fields are so important with um, the school systems right now. But government, I mean, I feel like, it, I mean, and, and you can definitely do that with while avoiding a bias, but focusing on just understanding right. of the process. Yeah. I think most, especially with youth, most people think like, my vote doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what I say or whatever because all of these things are like fixed anyway. But if, if you, you know, go to them at a younger level and educate them better, because if enough people say my vote doesn't count, then they're, and then. Well, right. I don't think that's just a lazy, um, it is, for honest, yeah. say like, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't even count, mm -hmm. so I'm not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's like, if you want it to matter and you want it to count, then you need to, you know, yep. get involved. Right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting stuff there. I'm sure we could talk about this forever, <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and go to a quick break. But coming up, the Jerome uh, Library is under some quick construction. Uh, but that is something um, older that we are talking about. But actually, what we're going to talk about next is the Tuesday election, um, how it broadened some marijuana legalization in some states when we return. Welcome back. Tuesday's election brought in some marijuana legalization in some states. Alaska and Oregon approved it in uh, Tuesday's election. D.C. voters overwhelmingly approved legalizing recreational purpose marijuana. Pot is still illegal in Ohio, but a growing number of people are in favor of legalization, and you could be asked to vote on it in the next year's election. The Ohio Rights Group is an organization that is trying to get marijuana legalized in the state. It is seeking signatures to petition the issue on Ohio's next election ballot. 
So I think, uh, honestly, if this were, would have been on the um, election ballot this year, maybe we'd have seen more of that young voter turnout, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, we've <coughs> been, you know, talking about legalization of marijuana, you know, in the, in the college atmosphere. It's been discussed a lot over in recent years, especially with Colorado's legalization of it a few years back. But now we have a lot of states, um, actually, I think 20, 20 states or 25 states uh, has it legalized for uh, medicinal purposes, and now we have three who, where it is uh, legalized for recreational purposes. And this is all happening pretty fast, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah I would. Uh, I think in the, within the next ballot, we're going to see even more, like double the amount that we have really? already. I, I believe so. Absolutely. I don't know. I think so. I, I, I. Yes, I do believe that it will grow, but I. I guess I don't really have an opinion on it because it's not like I don't really care either way. Well, so. I mean, there's a lot of. The concerns that have been raised as far as uh, safety, and they're comparing it to alcohol as far as how mm -hmm. we're going to regulate that use because they don't want people who are um, driving under it. But I actually mm -hmm. saw a report um, uh, about a year back uh, where a state had legalized marijuana, and they were all of a sudden, they kind of realized after they legalized it, they are like, oh, wait, we haven't any created laws. any laws for how much you can smoke before mm -hmm. you drive. And then they realized, how do you even gauge that? And because it's so different <laughs> based on who you are. Yeah, who's going to be a crash dummy for that, right? <laughs> well, exactly. And so they tested a few people, and they found that once they, they established the legal limit, um, they tested um, how much people could smoke beyond that until mm -hmm. they were um, not a safe driver. And it was like 10 times the amount. So they're basically saying, like, you can barely smoke any before driving. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of weird regulation stuff. Mm -hmm. So you'd think that would slow down the process. How do you think that would translate into an Ohio decision? Um, I think I think that I would hope that Ohio would learn from that mistake first of all, and mm -hmm. like make some rules and just like obviously do their research first before they're putting it on the ballot. But that's so hard too because so many. I mean, it's like that's probably the, the decision that they're having is people break laws every day, and so is it even like if we make these rules, who's going to follow it? How well is it going to be enforced? And I feel like that's so much harder too because like how do you? You can pull somebody over for speeding, but we're always saying, how can you see that I'm texting when I'm driving? Mm -hmm. How can you see that somebody is high on marijuana if they're driving, unless right. they're being completely reckless? I think Ohio's going <coughs> to, excuse me, Ohio's going to take it like these other states think of it. You know, marijuana's been so, you know, uh, decriminalized within these past couple mm -hmm. of years. So now it's just like, unless you have copious amounts, you right. won't even get, you know, a major fine or whatever for it. And also the fact that, you know, the profit that some of these states are making off of it, like Colorado, is ridiculous. Oh, goodness, yes. And, see, and that's what's on their minds. And it's not right, so much the safety, is. it's the profit that they're going to make. And also, prisons are going to be <coughs> a lot less populated because so many people are in prison for possession and mm -hmm. use and whatnot. And if that's decriminalized, I mean, overpopulation in prisons is such a problem, especially in Northwest Ohio. It is a big problem now, mm -hmm. prison population. So we actually have a county by county graphic here. If we can take a look, we can see um, what. Uh, counties, this is actually from the Ohio Rights Group, the group behind this legalization effort. The, some of these counties, the ones that are in appropriately in green, are the ones who have 5,000, or I'm sorry, no, 5% or more of the population of that county has signed the petition saying that they want this on the ballot. So these are the counties that appear to approve um, not necessarily the legalization of marijuana, but the um, right to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that, if I believe it's a little bit of a squished uh, Ohio there, but that is Wood County in the green, I believe. Wow. So, mm -hmm. Which I wonder how much of an influence that is from these students here I at BG. I mean, a huge influence. Mm -hmm. I bet if you look at those counties, the ones that have you know bigger college campuses or whatever, mm -hmm. I bet those are the major green ones, one with more youth population. Mm -hmm. Well, and the thing that I find funny is that you were, you, what we could kind of see on that map was that a lot of the rural areas were the areas that um, yeah. were not, you know, where they did not, where the, those petition signatures weren't, you know, gathered as mm -hmm. heavily. But those are the areas where it would be grown. And those are the areas where farmers, you know, if they maybe aren't having such a great season or are they, you know, maybe aren't making as much money. I don't, I know nothing about agriculture. I will admit that <laughs> right now. Right now, this is not farming advice. But um, you would think that that would be, I mean, imagine that new farming industry in Ohio alone just growing it. Yeah, I grew up actually in like a farm town area, mm -hmm. one of those areas that'll probably, that'll never get, people will never support it just because how it's been. But 
in Ohio, I don't think that'll be an issue. I don't think I'll see farmers saying, oh, I'm, I don't have any tobacco here, so I'm going to go grow pot. I think that would come from other states. And then, you know, the bigger cities in Ohio would be the ones to have it imported. Well, do you, I mean, if, if those um, rural um, area you know, workers are the ones who are like kind of like against it, do you think that the uh, idea of this could really benefit you financially by growing mm -hmm. it, do you think that could change some of their minds? Maybe, but I mean, I don't know how it's grown. I don't, and honestly, I, you don't really need to be an experienced farmer to grow marijuana. From what I have heard, there's a lot of people that get busted <laughs> for having marijuana just I mean, in their if basement. you can grow it easily in your basement, imagine how easily, I'm, I, again, I don't know anything about agriculture. I don't know anything about cannabis agri agriculture. But <laughs> I imagine if you can grow it in your basement, you could probably easily grow it in a field, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, in good, healthy amounts. You yeah, know, and I think there's probably different legislation as far as is it legal to grow it or is it legal to sell it. Absolutely. That, that, that'll be a big difference because I mean, I don't even where it's legal to all use it. I don't think you can sell it. Absolutely. Or, I mean, grow it. Definitely. Very interesting stuff there, and we're going to be following that. But when we come back, we're going to be looking at a different type of green conversation. An open area of land is up for discussion in town. We'll talk about how we have some ideas for the new BG Green Space. Stay with us. Welcome back. The unoccupied land on the corner of Wooster and Church Street has sparked conversation in Bowling Green. The Bowling Green Junior High and High School used to occupy this land. City officials have now spent two years considering what to build in its place. But recently the city says the public wants to keep the land a green space. A committee has formed for the project and will be taking ideas at a local hearing within the next week. Well, I know that we are kind of pseudo community members in a way because yeah. we're students. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, you know, we're, I mean, you know, we're part of the community. I love it. I love be. exploring this community. Absolutely. Here. So, you know, the green space, it's, I actually drove by it today. I went over to the bank and I saw it. Um, it's a little smaller than I thought it would be because when mm -hmm. I saw that mm -hmm. a high school and junior high school were in its place before, I was like, oh, that's got to be pretty pretty big, I right. imagine. Not very big. I forgot BG's pretty small, but um, <laughs> it's it's still a pretty good sizable spot. So I don't know if you guys, what would you put there if you could? So my idea is a park and everyone's going to say BG already has a city park, but I'm, in my opinion, the BG city park could be way bigger. Like I wish that they would put it in like, I don't know, like a little man-made pond and then like a walking trail. Like I know it's, like you said, it's not very big, so it's kind of limited to what you can put in there. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like BG, and, that, and in my hometown, we have a lot of parks that you can like go and you walk your dogs and you like go take your kids there and you play in the swing set and then you go walk around, you know, the pond and like go fish or something. Mm -hmm. So like something that would bring the community together because I feel like the city park here is got the pool and then it has this, the ice the skate rink which is really nice but it doesn't have anything like that people can go and okay. enjoy okay yeah i'd have to be especially if they want to keep it green some kind of park thing right like, and that like would be i would compromise. i would love another frisbee golf i mean we already have one here in bowling green but i love frisbee golf so give me another course to go to so okay. it's switch my game up no, a frisbee little golf's bit. a big my dad played frisbee golf when he went here back in oh. the day so he always asked me if i played and i'm just like no but you um should. <laughs> you, should, you should play it's a lot of fun <laughs> but i actually had an idea i think that what we should have is i like the outdoor idea up at the same time I'm always I'm thinking okay this is right by downtown how could we kind of bring those two things together I think there should it should be an outdoor amphitheater so like where yeah. like musicians could play That's That's a great kind of thing. That because if idea. you have that we have I mean back around front of in Middletown we have this thing called Broad Street Bash and it's where um, it's like in our downtown area and like bands will play and everyone there's like you know beer trucks and funnel cake you know, food trucks and mm -hmm. like little face painting, little things for the kids. And it's like a uh, community festival every Wednesday in the summer, basically, and bands play and stuff. And if you had that, it's right by downtown. It's right. like, you know, I mean, it could even be like a block party thing mm -hmm. where that little intersection right there is blocked off and everyone can just shop and eat and listen to music and stuff. And, and you know the city's probably looking for a way to turn a profit on this, too. Oh, so absolutely. that, would, that yes. would be a way to do that. And that'd be great because I always feel like the city gets turned upside down for a black swamp. Oh. Like, Oh, they that's turn huge. That, they turn that parking lot into a like concert theater, and it's like not really made for that. I, in my opinion, I'm always like, well, there's a stage over there. Yeah, it could be also utilized for Black Swamp, but also mm -hmm. I think because Black Swamp is so popular, I don't think I could see this being popular as well. I mean, there's a student population of you know mm -hmm. young people who want to go see. I mean, like we don't, we can't drive all the way out to Detroit and Columbus for concerts all the time. Right. So if we had this area for that, that would be cool, and I think it would bring in both the students and the community, kind of bring them together a little bit. And I think the big question though, which we haven't brought up, is what does the city have the budget? to build. Do they have yeah. the budget to build an amphitheater or do they just have a little budget to make a, you know, a, a lake or whatever, a little <laughs> pond 
or they just had to make it a park. I mean, I could understand where they're like, oh, well, the community wants to keep it a green space. Maybe we should, yeah, let's listen right. to the community keep it a green out. space. Well, they literally have to do nothing. And I mean, I know Except they, cut the grass. they put in a lot of effort and money, and it was a lot of community help to build, to build the new pool, the new city pool. Oh, I mean, yeah, that's a water park. Right. Yeah. And so let's be real. And that was like a levy that was passed. Mm -hmm. So I know that they, if they, I would assume they don't have a ton of money if they needed to get that money from the city, mm -hmm. um, people that live in the city to build that. So I'm sure that if something had to be built, it would probably have to go on a ballot. Well, either that or it'd have to be a com it would have to be a committee that forms to create, um, you know, a donation sort of plan and sort of a fundraising effort. It would probably take a few years, but I would think because there is potential revenue opportunity, especially mm -hmm. with local restaurants and like the downtown businesses mm -hmm. could really benefit from that. I could see them kind of getting behind that. But also I think students could get in on it because if they're like, hey, if you can promise to bring in good bands for us to listen to, we'll help in any way we can. Well, and I also think that students would take advantage of that. If it was like, oh, a, yeah. if you would make like a cheap student price for like a student, band from BG to come in, they would play there. I mean, we have <laughs> we have like artists on the like downtown streets every weekend night anyway. They're always like down there playing whatever instrument. I've seen like things from just the guitar to those like didgeridoos. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure that you could get enough people from the, like Bowling Green State University to play there too. Okay. Yeah, that is something that they should do. They should reach out to the campus. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you there are a bunch of people here who have some phenomenal ideas and yes. cheap ideas too. Mm -hmm. People go to school to, you know, study stuff like that, what oh, to yeah. do with this. Mm -hmm. So reach out to them. I'm sure they can offer plenty. You could bring the, the, uh, the city planning sort of like majors and the like uh, tourism and event planning majors. Yes. Probably gonna bring them together. Like mm -hmm. how are we gonna provide this like weekly, like community, like opportunity, like with mm -hmm. engagement and stuff? I mean, as long as they're like selling beer in that little area right there, <laughs> like when there's music playing, I'm down. Mm -hmm. People, people no. will come. You yeah. know, it would be so cool too to turn into a ice rink in the, in the winter time. Oh, that, that, that would be good. Uh, mm -hmm. Gosh, well maybe we should go to this yes. committee <laughs> meeting and bring our ideas, bring the producers panel there, there and talk to them. <laughs> Well, uh, coming up when we return, uh, we're going to talk about movies playing in theaters this weekend. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, it's Friday. We've got the weekend ahead. A couple big movies coming to theaters this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about two of them really quick. Uh, first one, big anticipated film, uh, Interstellar. Mm. Definitely something that I'm looking forward to. If, in case you're not aware of it, I can pull up what's, uh, according to IMDb, uh, Interstellar is a, a group of explorers make use of a newly discovered wormhole to surpass the limitations on human space travel and conquer the vast distance involved in an interstellar oh. voyage. <laughs> A lot of big words there. And a lot of big stars in this movie, yes. too. Absolutely. I was like watching the trailer and I was like, whoa, whoa, yeah, so whoa. Anne Hathaway, uh, Matthew McConaughey, mm. especially after Matthew McConaughey's reinvented himself as an actor. Oh, He's absolutely. been so much better. Yes. And it, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan is directing, mm -hmm. who is one of my I favorite directors of all great. time. He's never made a bad film, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's a very Christopher Nolan. It's uh, nearly three hours, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you can imagine that that's going to be a uh, long one, but probably really good and visually awesome. I think yes. that actually might be an IMAX tonight, Ooh. so. We also have The Theory of Everything, completely different type of movie. It's like a biopic about Stephen Hawking. Um, oh, okay, it's yeah. It's beautiful. I saw the trailer, and the trailer itself is just like such a delight to see. It's like a work of art. It's, it's gorgeous. It's about like how he became like famous essentially, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, how he became well known and mm -hmm. his uh, and his struggles, definitely. That's so we're definitely gonna wanna have to check that out, but mm -hmm. you know, we were, we're, um, we're out of time now, but be sure to check us out on social media and on our website at bg24news.org. Stay safe this weekend and everyone have a great one.